and I hope that you will join me. I hope you'll get your Bible and test everything that I say and make sure that everything that I'm saying is truly from the Scriptures. I want you to do that with every sermon that I preach, and I think I speak for Joe as well in that, but I especially want you to do that this morning because I may be challenging some things that you have thought previously. I may be saying some things to you this morning that are a little bit different than what you've heard before. I think sometimes people who have an association among churches of Christ have thought, you know, nobody else in the religious world approaches the Bible in the way that we do. You know, we hear sermons that talk about things like Bible authority and the importance of it. Sometimes you, you hear expressions like, command, example, and necessary inference being used and thrown around. And I think sometimes people sit back and they say, I don't know about all that. All that discussion about Bible authority and all that stuff about command and example, where do you find that in the Bible? Surely people among churches of Christ are the only people in the world who look at the Bible like that. You ever thought that before? It's okay if you have. It's okay. I felt like that at one time before. Maybe you've talked to other people who have said something like that before. Surely, sometime, a long time ago, a bunch of, and I'm going to put this in quotes for those who can't see me this morning, who may be listening to the audio later, a bunch of Church of Christ preachers, I hate that expression by the way, but a bunch of Church of Christ preachers sat around a table one time and talked about how they're going to convince everybody to approach the Bible. But folks, that's just not true. It is just plain wrong to suggest that nobody else approaches the Scripture in the way that we do in the churches of Christ. In fact, just this past week, I read two books in preparations for the sermon this morning written by Reformed thinkers. Now let me pause for just a moment and tell you what I mean by that. A Reformed person is somebody who comes out of a particular Christian religious heritage. Don't use the word in the same way you might talk about a reformed drug addict. That's not what it means. Reformed thinking is a religious tradition in the Protestant world. So I read two books by reformed thinkers this week. One of them a Presbyterian, one of them a Baptist. And these two books were on the subject of instrumental music. And guess what? They made the exact same arguments that you've heard me and other gospel preachers make for decades. And what was even more interesting about this was not only did they use the same arguments, they used the exact same vernacular. Command, example, and inference. They talked about the silence of the Scriptures and how we need to respect areas of the Scriptures that God has not told us anything. They talked about the dangers of presumption and how we don't need to assume that God would be okay with us doing something when He hasn't said anything to us about it. And as I read those books, I thought, wow, you know, there's a lot of people who are very critical of those Church of Christ preachers and the way that we approach the Bible. And yet, these two guys that I read, they're not affiliated with Churches of Christ at all. In fact, although I would agree with everything these two guys said on the instrumental music question, there are a number of other questions in the Scripture that we would be very much opposed. One of these guys wrote a book in 1888. And the other guy's book came out in 2007. And I want to share with you some things from those two books this morning, but the primary book that I want to study from, of course, is the book that God has given to us. But these two books that I read this week, they got me to thinking a little bit more deeply on the subject of instrumental music. And so I want to share with you this morning some thoughts on the question of instrumental music, and particularly what I'd like to do this morning is talk about Instruments of music in the public worship of God's people. And this morning in part one, I want to focus on the Old Testament scriptures. And so let me be very clear about what we are and what we are not talking about this morning. We are not talking about instrumental music in someone's private devotion. I'm not talking about King David with his harp or his lyre out in the woods with the sheep playing Personally, That's not what I'm talking about. The scriptures do 
give us instances of that. And there are examples of that. But we're not talking about private devotion this morning. That's not our focus. We're talking about the public worship of God's people. And specifically, we're talking about the public worship of God's people in, first, the tabernacle, and secondly, in the temple that replaced it. So what I want to do to begin this morning is to present to you a thesis that I hope to defend. And this thesis has two parts to it. Part number one says this, God alone has the right to determine how He wishes to be worshipped. Now, I don't think that I need to defend that with anybody here. I suspect everybody here agrees with that statement. That God knows what He wants, and that God, if He chooses, will tell us what He wants when it comes to any subject. But God alone has the right to determine how He wants to be worshipped. I'm not going to tell God how to do His business. I'm not going to presume to tell God what He thinks about anything. God, if He wants me to know something, He will tell me. I think we're probably all convinced of that. But the second part of this thesis is what I'm really going to spend most of my time this morning defending. And this one, I might have to do a little bit of convincing. So here's part two of this. That is that there is no record in Scripture of a musical instrument being used in public worship without an explicit divine command. I want to say that again. You will not find a record in Scripture of musical instruments being used in the public worship of God's people without God telling His people that's what He wanted them to do. So can I show you that this morning? I had you open to Numbers chapter 10. That's the first passage that we're going to look at together. And of course, we're talking here about the tabernacle time period. So we're dealing here with the days of the tabernacle worship while the Israelites were in the wilderness outside the land of Canaan. God specifies some things about instrumental music that He wants incorporated into the public worship of the tabernacle. So I want to read a few verses with you from Numbers chapter 10. I've put all the, the first 10 verses of the chapter there. We're not going to read through this whole section. But read with me the first two verses of Numbers chapter 10. The Lord spoke further to Moses saying, Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Of hammered work you shall make them. And you shall use them for summoning the congregation, number one. And number two, for having the camps set out. Now you remember that when the Israelites were traveling, that they were out in the wilderness, the tabernacle, when it was erected, was at the center of the camp. And all of the tribes would be camped out around the tabernacle with it being in the center. And so God says to Moses, when it's time for everybody to pack up their things and to move out the camp, you blow the two trumpets. But it's also to be used, verse 2 says, when you summon the congregation. What would be some things you would summon the congregation for? Well, one of those things it's going to say later is to bring everyone together for worship. So look at verse 10, where it says, Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts, so on your festival worship days, and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord, your God. So there's going to be two trumpets. I take it that one of the trumpets would be longer and one of them would be shorter. Why? Because they would make two different sounds. And even in this very passage, it talks about distinguishing between the sounds. And so there's going to be two trumpets that make different sounds. Maybe one's a little bit lower pitched, one's a little bit higher pitched. And when you blow them together, the Israelites can distinguish what is being stated through the blowing of those trumpets. What's being called. So you've got two trumpets made of silver. Who's going to blow the trumpets? Verse 8. Verse 8 says, The priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets. So the priests of Aaron, the descendants of Aaron, are going to be the ones who blow the two trumpets to summon the congregation to come together, verse 10, on their festival days. And they're going to do it on the first of the month. And whenever there are burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings being offered, the trumpets will be played. Now these two trumpets were the only 
instruments that were used during the tabernacle time period. During the wandering in the wilderness and during the time of the tabernacle, there were no other instruments that God said He wanted used until the time of David comes many years later, some 400 years later. So God explicitly stated here that He wanted instruments to be used on the festival worship days. He specified the number of instruments. He specified what instruments. He specified who was to play the instruments and when the instruments were to be played. You see all that in Numbers 10? All right. This was not something that was up to Moses' judgment. This was not Moses' personal opinion. You know, Moses wrote a few psalms in the book of Psalms. Moses, Moses knew some things about music, apparently. But God didn't leave this up to his judgment. God made explicit instructions about all of these things. Now, there are some other passages that we're going to look at in the next few minutes that come from the books of the Chronicles. The books of First and Second Chronicles. You can be turning over there if you'd like to do that. The first one we'll look at is in First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15. But what do you know about the books of the Chronicles? Well, they're just like First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, right? It's all about kings and their lives and the good things and the bad things that they did. And that's all that the Chronicles are. Wrong. That's some of it. Chronicles does talk some about the kings and the good things they did and the bad things that they did. But do you realize that the books of the Chronicles also have a lot to say about God's worship? They have a lot to say about the priests and the servants who are going to be in the tabernacle and in the temple performing the service of God. In 1 Chronicles chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, so in those four chapters... The narrative of the Chronicles is David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And you have there the whole story about Uzzah and him touching the Ark and what happened there because they didn't do it the way they were supposed to. And then you have in 1 Chronicles 15 where the Ark is coming back that second attempt and now they're going to do it right. Now the priests are going to carry that Ark on those poles on their shoulders like they were supposed to from the very beginning. And so the ark is going to come back into Jerusalem. And as the tabernacle here is done away with, and now the temple is going to be constructed later in 1 Chronicles, what happens to those Levites whose job it was to carry all of the tabernacle equipment? What do they do now? Well, in fact, if you keep your finger in 1 Chronicles 15, but if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 23, we're given the answer to that. What's going to happen to those Levites now that the tabernacle is being done away with? 1 Chronicles 23, if you look at verses 25 and 26, we're given the answer. David said, verse 25, 1 Chronicles 23, The Lord God of Israel has given rest to His people, and He dwells in Jerusalem forever. Also, the Levites will no longer need to carry the tabernacle and all of its utensils for its service. But now what are they going to do? What are these Levites going to do? Their job's just been taken away from them. Well, look at 1 Chronicles 15 for the answer. 1 Chronicles 15, the ark is being brought into Jerusalem. And if you begin reading with me at verse 16, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, David spoke to the chiefs of the Levites, those people who don't have a job anymore because now the temple's about to be built. He spoke to the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their relatives, the singers, notice, with instruments of music, harps, lyres, loud sounding cymbals, to raise sounds of joy. And starting in verse 17, he's going to go on and he's going to name the specific people who are given the task. And so, in verse 19, the singers, and their names are given, they were appointed, verse 19, to sound aloud symbols of bronze. Verse 21 mentions those who are going to be given the lyres. Verse 22 is very interesting to me. Kenaniah, chief of the Levites, was in charge of the singing. He gave instruction in singing because he was skillful. And then verse 24 mentions a few names, and it says that they blew the trumpets before the ark of God. I wonder which trumpets they were blowing. You think it was maybe those ones from Numbers chapter 10, possibly? David gives the Levites, whose task of carrying 
the ark, or excuse me, carrying the, uh, the tabernacle and then all of its furnishings, the ark and the, the basin and all this stuff, they, they don't have that job anymore because now the temple is going to be set up. So David says, tell you what, you guys are going to become the choir. You're going to become the band. You're going to be the singers and you're going to have harps and lyres and loud sounding cymbals. And you're going to play these instruments. If you look at chapter 23 again, chapter 23 of 1 Chronicles, chapter 23, start reading verse 3. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that David is getting old and he's about to hand things off to Solomon. Verse 3 says, The Levites were numbered from 30 years old and upward, and their number by census of men was 38,000. You've got 38,000 Levites that David is going to assign tasks to. Now, how does this break down? Of these, verse 4, 24,000 were to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. And 6,000 were officers and judges. And 4,000 were gatekeepers. Notice now, 4,000 were praising the Lord with the instruments which David made for giving praise. 4,000 Levites are going to be singing and playing musical instruments. But notice the wording of verse 5. Praising the Lord with the instruments which David made for giving praise. You know, at this point in the record, the only thing that God has said about musical instruments in the public worship of the Jews is that He wants two trumpets. God has not at this point in the record said anything else. So why does David add these instruments? Why does he add harps and lyres and cymbals? Did he just do that of his own accord? Did he just say, you know what, I like music, I like to play the harp, I like to play music, let's just bring in some more instruments. Well, at this point in the record, we're not told why David did it. We have to jump ahead about 300 years to learn why David added these instruments. So let's do that. Let's jump ahead to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles 29. Now, again, we're fast-forwarding 300 years chronologically to the reign of Hezekiah. When Hezekiah became the king in Judah, the nation was in a terrible way spiritually. And Hezekiah would immediately begin reforming the spiritual path of the nation. And among those reforms are the cleaning out and the restoration of the temple that Solomon had built. So he's going to clean out the temple. He's going to purge out the idols and all of the wickedness in the land. And he's going to start over and reinstitute and restore public worship in the temple. So look at chapter 29 and verse 25. Here's one of the things that he does. Hezekiah then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, and with lyres. Notice, according to the command of David and of Gad, the king's seer or prophet, and of Nathan, the prophet, notice this last expression in verse 25, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. You see that? Hezekiah goes back to the time of David. And he says, you know what? The Levites are going to be the ones who sing and who offer praise on the instruments. And they're going to be the ones who do it because that's what David said to do. Interesting, Hezekiah doesn't go back to Numbers chapter 10. He goes back to David's command. Why does he do that? Because the verse explicitly said that David's command to add those instruments, the harps, the lyres, and the cymbals, it was actually God's command through the prophets, Gad and Nathan and David. God revealed to those men that this is what he wanted done. He didn't any longer just want the two trumpets. Now he wanted harps to be added and lyres to be added and loud cymbals to be added. And the Levites are going to be the ones who do this. God explicitly gave instruction to David to do that. 
It wasn't up to David's opinion or best judgment. David wasn't thinking for himself here. He does this because that's what God told him to do. David recognized that he had no liberty to act in areas where God has not told him to do this. But God, because he had told David to do this, he was acting with God's approval. So now, regarding the construction of the temple. David, you know, is not going to be the one to build the temple, right? And yet, God gives to David very detailed blueprints for how the temple is to be constructed. If you go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 with me, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, I want you to notice what David says about this blueprint for the temple. As you're turning there, I want you to just think about this. David wanted to build the temple, right? You remember that. But God said, no, you're not going to be the one to do it. Your descendant will be the one to do it. And we know Solomon is going to be the one who actually carries out the construction of the temple. But even though David wasn't going to be the one to build it, God gave him these very specific instructions about the temple. How many rooms, how big it was supposed to be, and so forth. Do we think that God would have revealed to David the instructions and the blueprints for the temple in such precise specifications and God would have just forgotten to say anything to David about the worship that's supposed to take place once the temple is built? That would be a pretty big oversight, wouldn't it? Well, God didn't do that. God spoke to David about the worship that was supposed to take place in the temple. And that's what we just saw in that passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. But look at chapter 28 of 1 Chronicles and look at what is said by David in verse 11. David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch of the temple, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord and for all the surrounding rooms and for the storehouses of the house of God and for the storehouses of the dedicated things also for the divisions of the priests and the Levites and for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord and for all the utensils of service in the house of the Lord and so forth. Verse 13 says, God gave David specific instructions about what the Levites were supposed to do in worship in the temple. And so it's those instructions that David then takes and he passes on to Solomon who is going to carry those instructions into the temple like his father David had done. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Here's where Solomon does that. Here's where he incorporates God's instructions to David about adding those instruments, the harps, the lyres, the cymbals, Here's where Solomon incorporates those instructions into the temple worship, the temple that he has built. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11, beginning. When the priests came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and their sons and kinsmen, clothed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets in unison when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify God. And when they lifted up their voice accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord saying, He indeed is good for His loving kindness is everlasting, then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God." A couple of things I want you to see in that passage. Solomon takes the precise, specific instructions that his father David had given him, which the Lord had given him, and he brings those into the temple worship of God's people. This is what God said to my father. This is what my father told me to do. And so I appoint the Levites in their divisions, and I have the singers, and I have the harps, and the lyres, and the cymbals, just like my father said. Just like God told him. 
God had given specific instruction of what he wanted done, and now Solomon is doing it. Did you notice it said there were 120 trumpets? Did you notice that? Where did that come from? Back in Numbers 10, there were only two. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I'll offer this possibility. That when God gave the instruction to David about adding the harps and the lyres and the cymbals and so forth, he might have said, oh, and you can add more trumpets to the mix as well. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe the Bible doesn't give us the answer. Maybe you can help me with that if you know where it is. Singers and instruments are present. Why? Turn over just a couple of pages. Look at chapter 8 of 2 Chronicles. Chapter 8. I told you we had lots of Bible to look at this morning. 2 Chronicles chapter 8, look at verse 14. Now according to the ordinance of his father David, he appointed the divisions of the priests for their service and the Levites for their duties of praise and of ministering before the priests according to the daily rule. At the end of the verse it says, For David the man of God had so commanded. And they did not depart from the commandment of the king to the priests and the Levites in any manner or concerning the storehouses. This is what David commanded. And 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 25, that passage about Hezekiah tells us it's actually what God commanded David do. Now let me pause here for just a moment and say, have you believed for some time, maybe even a long time, that God is just opposed to instruments of music and nowhere in the Bible did He ever tell His people to do it. It's just something that they decided to do one day. Have you thought that? I've thought that before. And you know what that means? That means I wasn't a very good student of my Old Testament. That means I didn't spend as much time in the books of Chronicles as I should have. Because there for a time I thought God just hated instruments all along and people just did it because they wanted to and they liked them. No. God specifically, explicitly, asked for instruments of music to be used in Old Testament public worship. Now, pardon me, I fell behind one click there. We talked about 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Or excuse me, 1 Chronicles 23. Look with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 23 now. Now, as you're turning there, let me just give you a little bit of a summation of where we are historically at this point. The temple's already been built. Solomon instituted everything that David, that God commanded be instituted in the worship of God's people. But lo and behold, the Israelites didn't always do what God wanted, did they? You know, they fell away from God. They became wicked. They followed the path of their evil kings. And they turned away from God. And so the Old Testament is filled with a number of restoration stories. So maybe kings would come along or some other great leader would come along and say to the people, we've got to get back to God. We've got to get back to living for Him and being more spiritually minded and doing the things that God wants us to do. Now I want to show you several of these over the course of the next few minutes. And I want to point out some interesting things that we see in these instances of restoration of public worship in the Old Testament. So the first one is here in 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Jehoiada is the name of a priest. Jehoiada lives about 170 years after King David. Okay, And we're going to go through these in chronological order. 170 years roughly after David. 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Jehoiada is leading great spiritual reforms in the nation. And if you look with me at verse 18. Verse 16, Jehoiada made a covenant that they would be God's people. Verse 17, the idols are removed. Verse 18 then, moreover, Jehoiada placed the offices of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priests whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord as it is written in the law of Moses with rejoicing and singing, notice, according to the order of David. I want you to notice there that the Levites and the sacrifices, it says, they were done according to what the law of Moses says. But the worship in the temple of the singing and the instruments, that was not done according to what the law of Moses said. It was done according to the commandment of David. 
And that goes back to what we've already talked about this morning. We've already considered Hezekiah's reforms some 300 years after David. So let's move ahead now to the reforms of Josiah some 400 years after King David. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. <laughs> Josiah reforms the public worship as well, cleanses out the temple, brings in the singers and the instruments of music. Look at chapter 35 and verse 3 beginning. He also said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon the son of David, king of Israel, built. It will be a burden on your shoulders no longer. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves by your father's households in your divisions according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of his son Solomon. Drop down to verse 15. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were also at their stations according to the command of David. I want you to keep seeing that expression, according to the command of David, according to the command of David. And that expression is pointing us back to David's additions of the singers, the harps, the lyres, and the cymbals. All right? But notice these reformers, they keep going back to what David had said because it was actually God's commandment, wasn't it? As we've seen already. Well, not long after this, the nation goes into captivity. Their wickedness became so bad that God allows the Babylonians to come in and to carry them off into Babylonian captivity. Now, turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I simply want to introduce this here. I'm going to come back to this later in the lesson. But because chronologically we're in the Babylonian captivity, I'm going to go ahead and show this to you. You remember in Daniel chapter 3 the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar set up this giant golden image and he said, whenever you hear this music, you're to stop what you're doing, bow down to the image that I've created. In Daniel chapter 3, and verse 5. Well, let's start at verse 4. We'll pick up the whole commandment. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse 7 repeats the decree, but I want you to notice the instruments that are mentioned. Were there some funny words there? It mentions bagpipes. You didn't know that these were Scotsmen, did you? I really doubt it's the same thing that we think of when we talk about bagpipes. But notice horn, flute, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe. There may be some translational differences from my Bible to yours, but basically I want you to see this. What instruments have we seen in all of the Jewish scriptures so far? We've seen cymbals. We've seen the lyre. We've seen trumpets. We haven't seen any of these, have we? In Babylon, the people were introduced to instruments and music that they'd never heard of before. They'd never seen these things before. I want you to just hold that in your mind, okay? And we'll come back to that thought a little bit later. Now, turn with me to Ezra chapter 3. So as you're thinking about those weird instruments that the people saw, Ezra chapter 3 is where we're turning now. This is after the captivity. The people have returned under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua, the first group of of captives, that is, have returned under their leadership. So here we are now some 500 years after King David. The temple is being rebuilt. And in Ezra chapter 3 and in verse 10, it says, When the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, notice, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to to the directions of King David. Isn't that interesting? The same expression is used. They're going back 
to what David commanded. They're not going back to Numbers chapter 10. They're going back to the most recent statement from God. And that was the command of David. All right, one more passage about restoration. Look at Nehemiah chapter 12. So go over to the next book, Nehemiah chapter 12. Now we're about 600 years after King David. And the worship needs to be rejuvenated. It needs to be restored again. So in Nehemiah chapter 12, look with me beginning... We're going to look at several verses in this chapter, but look, at me, look with me at verse 24. Verse 24. The heads of the Levites were... All those names, all right? Pardon me for skipping over them for a moment. With their brothers opposite them to praise and give thanks as prescribed by David, the man of God. All right, drop down to verse 35. And some of the sons of the priests with trumpets. And here's a few more names that are given. Verse 36 says these other names with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. Drop down a little bit more, look at verse 45. They performed the worship of their God and the service of purification together with the singers and the gatekeepers in accordance with the command of David and of his son Solomon. For in the days of David and Asaph in ancient times, there were leaders of the singers, songs of praise, and hymns of thanksgiving to God. According to to the commandment of David. Every single case of Old Testament restoration of public worship of God's people went back to the commandment of David. Have you seen that as we've looked at all of these? I sure hope so. I've been trying my hardest to emphasize it. Every time they went back to God's command given to David. They were looking for a regulating principle. That is, instruction from God that would regulate their action, that would tell them what to do. You see, these men never presumed that they had liberty or freedom or authority to just do whatever they wanted to do in the worship of God. When it comes to the worship of the house of God, we must do it according to the commandment of God. Even those men, 600 years after David, they said, what did David say about this? What's the most recent thing that we have heard from God? It's all the way back, 600 years ago, to what David said. Now, I asked you to think about and remember those new instruments that the people would have been introduced to in Babylon. You remember those? The trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and some of those things. I have no idea what the instruments were. Okay, please don't ask. But I asked you to remember that, and here's why. Is it safe for us to assume that the people of Israel's exposure to those Babylonian instruments and the worship styles and the kind of music that they were hearing in Babylon. Is it safe for us to assume that the Israelite people were influenced by that music? Is it safe for us to at least grant that they must have heard it? They must have known about it. And I think it's possible that we could say maybe even they came to like it and get used to it. I'm not being dogmatic on that. I'm just saying we have to grant it as a possibility. But after the captivity, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and so forth, when these reformations were taking place, and they're trying to answer questions like, well, how are we going to worship God in the temple? What does God want us to do? Are we going to have instruments? If so, which ones? Who's going to play them? What instruments did they incorporate into the worship? It was harps, lyres, and cymbals, and trumpets. You don't read about bagpipes, and psalteries, and trigons, and any of those other Babylonian instruments. Now, why am I making that point? I'm not making that point just because I think it's interesting. There's an application to be made here. 
For those in the religious world around us who worship God in public worship settings with instruments, you can answer this for me by just a simple head nod, yes or no. Have the instruments changed over time? Oh, come on. I'm looking for more than that, folks. I got like three people. All right. Yeah. Yes, they have. When we get to part two of this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the things that have happened in history and some of the instruments that were used. It all started with an organ. And then the organ led to the piano. And I realized that the more traditional elements in the world around us worship with pianos. But, I mean, you know that people now have guitars and drums and electric guitars and rock bands. And it's changed, hasn't it? If God's people in the Old Testament didn't feel like they had the right to change the instruments without an explicit command from God to do so, why would people today feel like they could change the instruments without such a statement from God? The men of the Bible said, dare I say it, we need to go back to the Bible and speak where the Bible speaks. And if God has said something about how He wants to be worshipped, we need to honor that. We need to listen to what God has said. Neither Moses with those trumpets, nor David with the harps, the lyres, and the cymbals. Neither Moses nor David introduced into the public worship of God's people instruments without an explicit divine warrant for doing so. I hope I've shown that to you this morning. Let me wrap up with this. One of those authors that I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson about those two books that I read this week, one of those was a man by the name of John Gerardo. If you're interested in this book, I'll mention the title for you. You can jot it down. You can find it for free on the internet because it's so old. The name of Mr. Gerardo's book is called Instrumental Music in the Public Worship of the Church. It's about 200 pages. Well worth it. Rich reading. Instrumental music in the public worship of the church. Mr. Gerardo was actually a South Carolina man. He was a professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. Mr. Gerardo was a Reformed Presbyterian. And he talked a lot about Old Testament public worship. And here's something he said in his book. In the Jewish dispensation, God kept the ordering of this part of His formal and instituted worship in His own hands. There is positive proof that it was never made an element of that worship except by His express command. That is, instrumental music was never made a part of God's worship without His express command. Without His warrant, it was excluded. Only with it was it employed. I hope I've convinced you of that this morning, if you were maybe unsure or doubtful of that. And I hope that the lesson has been helpful to you this morning. As I said at the beginning, this is part one, where we talked about public worship in the Old Testament. Can you guess what part two is going to be? I think there's two testaments in the Bible, right? So we're going to talk about public worship of God's people in the New Testament. We're going to talk about instrumental music in the public worship in the New Testament. And I would love to tell you that I'm going to do that tonight, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it tonight or if I'm going to do it in two weeks. So I guess you'll just have to come back tonight to find out, won't you? Hope you can be with us tonight at 6 o'clock. I will say this about our 6 o'clock service. Tonight's Bible drill is going to be the last one for the year. Okay? We took a break. At the end, all the kids are like, no! All right, we took a break last year at the end of October. And so we're just taking a break for the holidays and letting everybody travel and get all that. And uh, quite frankly, we're just giving Mr. Ben a break too, okay? So tonight's going to be our last Bible drill for the year. And we'll start that back the first week of January in 2020, God willing. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If we can help you this morning to give your life to the Lord and become a Christian by being baptized in water for the remission of your sins, or if you need to return to the Lord and begin serving Him again, we will pray with you and for you, and you will have the Lord's forgiveness and ours. And if we can help you this morning, we invite you. Please come as we stand and sing together.